Going over the Beehive sprinkler controller installation, now this one is Wi-Fi enabled. What that's going to allow us to do is vary the programming, the on and off times and, and length of time that a sprinkler head is going to be active or not active. We can vary it according to software and commands over the internet. So this, this is for a, a, a on-grid type of an application unless you're off-grid and still can maintain internet communication. In cities where you've got kind of a, a water bill situation and you don't want to waste water by running your sprinklers on a strictly timer basis when it's raining because then you're, you're spending money for nothing, right? On the other hand, if you have a dead lawn, that can be a eyesore, a fire hazard, and can harm your property values. Not only that, but it can uh, piss off your neighbors because... If your place is looking like crap, well, then it harms their property values, and, and so you have a cascading effect with that. Uh, what this is going to allow you to do is also remotely control these things. Up to recently, you're looking at about $500 for a, a Wi-Fi-enabled sprinkler controller, which can be remotely controlled. Uh, now they're down to $100, $150, $200. Bucks. This particular one was just over $100 bucks at Home Depot. One of the other things it's really good for is residential locations in towns and cities where it's in a maintenance status, you're not there all the time, and you don't want to pay uh, uh, gardeners, full-time people to go maintain it all the time. You can even have your gardener remotely control the sprinklers and that sort of stuff without having to make a trip out there. Uh, the way these things are going to work is... The cheaper model runs up to six different uh, sprinkler heads. More expensive model looks almost identical, but has another little jumper box that goes to these little jumpers here. Probably slightly more complex stuff in the electronics package, and that can run up to twelve. Uh, now that's running up to twelve valves. One valve may run more than one sprinkler. It kind of depends on what's going on with that. And I mainly do the electrical work. I'm not doing the plumbing on this at all. So what we have is an existing sprinkler controller box. This one was a rain dial plus. It's been deactivated because the, the homeowners have had problems programming this. They're going to get tired of it. It's not very old. And um, as I was getting into this, I, I started to realize what I think may have been the core of the problem is that after installation, um, you know, it wasn't made clear to people that these are not the only controls. There's actually, when you open this up, there's, there's some other buttons. This was set to take commands from a rain sensor, which was optional. So if that, if that thing wasn't installed, then nobody would know that this thing is, is actually waiting for commands from a very simple water sensor device that if it was raining, it wasn't going to work. Well, what happened was this thing was only working on manual, wasn't working on automatic, or having these issues. So this may, you know, may still be good, but it's not Wi-Fi enabled, so it's still coming out. What we have are pre-wired sprinkler controllers. Um, it wasn't clear to me which one's a positive or a negative on these things, but I'm, I'm going to see this as VC, voltage common. These are all going to the same thing, so we're, we're going to call that the negative on this. And when we go into the settings, the instructions on this are not very detailed. There are some other videos and websites online, but they want one end of each one of these to go into a COM thing, and, it's, and you can see here it's not very large. It looks like it's only made for one wire, and then they want one wire in each one of these, um, which I'm not a real big fan of, and so what we're going to do is, is I'm going to split them. We've got four, so we're only using four, two over here, two over here, and then one, two, three, four for the colored um, connections. And whenever you're putting in a device like this, uh, especially the Wi-Fi enabled stuff, uh, if you're the electrician or the installer, um, you know, you're not going to be familiar with every device out there. Uh, I had kind of an angry client a while back over a heating and air conditioner control. I'd done several of them that were entirely successful. There is somehow they seem to think that 
the installation may have damaged a circuit board in another device and I'm like well you know we pull the wires off the stuff that had the same label we put them back in where it had the same label if it worked when I went it probably should have worked a week later we we don't know so we need to be very careful about putting things into a similarly labeled connector double checking the instructions doing the best we can with this stuff so what we're seeing here is there's a 24 volt input and when I check this, what I, what I find is that there is a, a, what we call a wall word, a voltage converter thing here, which was taking your AC convert current and converting it over to 24 volt in order for this device to function, which means that this is naturally a DC power device. Now, as a DC 24 volt device, it's not going to run directly off our solar equipment unless we're running 24 volt solar which is interesting because if this thing remains functional we're going to pull it out very carefully not destroy it save it for a possible off-grid application the other thing we're going to do is we're going to try to keep an eye on label these things now these wires are all the same color we're not going to know without further testing which one goes to which sprinkler head uh, what we do know is that the power was coming off of this cord here, coming up through, connecting to these two little pin connectors. And with this large wall plug-in piece, that was preventing anything else from being plugged in up here. Uh, for example, when I installed these security cameras, I, I had to hardwire some power in the back. So even though it's a wireless camera, we're still wiring stuff in. And that's so that we can verify everything we're controlling in this house online uh, by eyeballing it, eyeballing it through the camera. So it's still electrical wiring, even though it's wireless. It's just wireless for control wires. We're, we're still electrical wiring a lot of other stuff. Um, over here, what happens is this plugs into AC, but here we can see that there is a voltage converter that's inside the box. The 24 volt out thing, so it could power maybe a secondary unit like a little weather station sensor. And that's a little more advanced, we're not going to be messing with that right now. But there's a few different ways your software program will be able to get its weather information, so that's one of them. And of course, the sensor, we're not going to mess with that because it is, uh, we're going off of online weather predictions, that's what's going to be programming the. the uh, the, the stuff on this. So it's, it's not automatic, it's not off of its own sensors, it's basically off of weather predictions online. Uh, they're also going to give you a little screwdriver for undoing these tiny little screws. Those of you who followed my other videos on uh, solar charge controllers will find it's, it's very similar equipment. Uh, they give a few mounting screws and all that. Basically on the back of the unit um, We've got a single hanging thing where it hangs from a screw and then they want you to punch a hole into it um, through one of these just to keep it from rotating on a hanging screw. We're going to mess with that a little bit later. It's, it's kind of engineered where it could be interior or external uh, mounting. I will highly suggest not, not putting these things entirely outdoors, but it's somewhat weather resistant. I just I don't think it's storm proof. And of course they give you a little key controller for this to open and close it. It's very simple, very basic. Um, I wouldn't mess with it too much. Uh, the other thing is, of course, is easy access customer service. If you have any questions, you can call them or you can put it in the comment section of the video and we'll, we'll go from there on that. Uh, so this is basically the unit and we're going to go on with the actual installation once I get the old one removed. Getting into the wall installation was relatively simple. Both these units use basically a, a little hang screw arrangement at the top and then a penetrating screw at the bottom to uh, keep it from lifting or rotating. So I, I put one in a pre-existing spot because the screw just kind of self drills the plastic. Now in the bottom here were some knockouts like you'd see at, a, at an electrical box. But instead of putting a ring lock thing in there, um, I, I want to use a smaller hole, maybe silicone that. This hole was already here, and of course they already had a hole for the power cord going into that. Um, going through these wires, what I realized happening is white's the common on these, 
and then a green and a red for different sprinkler circuits. Well this one because these were connected into stuff this one I could tell that this wire was actually controlling two sprinklers that probably go to a similar place on a wire run. These are controlling one each so for the unused wire that was inside of there they, they just kind of wrap that up at the base to show that that's, that's not the one being used. In theory, I could clip those off, but I'm, I, I want to avoid that. The thing is that when I feed these through the, the holes, well, I don't want it stopping up on there either. So, um, you know, we're going to see how that's going to work. I may drill a larger diameter up there. Relatively simple. Next, we'll, we'll show how the connections work up here. All right, so with these wires fit up through there, actually I have one extra hole because I, I realized that's not four wires in that bundle is three so we're we're gonna pull through enough that I've got slack for everything this one's getting a little stubborn with me I might pull it out and drill a wider hole or we can get that to come through fortunately the previous installer knew to leave slack in the wiring and so we're able to we're able to kind of pull that through work with that and then get it hooked up to our connectors here okay so in Putting these in, I decided to go ahead and twist these wires together before putting them in. They were all in the common ground thing before, so there's no reason not to put them in a common ground thing now. And then the rest of these, um, I trimmed the wires back a little bit um, because they've been stripped pretty far to go into a different type of screw arrangement. But I, I wanted a little bit showing so that if I got up to stick a multimeter on there and get a reading, I could. Although in theory, I could just get readings off of these screw heads too. Uh, we plug it in, pull the little tab on the battery thing, which may cause the battery to pop out, which it did. Okay, okay so the wires are hooked up. There's a little plastic tab you got to pull out for the battery back up, and when you pull it out, it's going to cause the battery to jump out. So you got to make sure it goes back in correctly. Um, button facing uh, the other direction, which will eventually be forward. We've got all of these ground wires, where tw I twisted them together, put them up here on a common port. Each sprinkler head control then goes on its own. Now, I left a little bit of the stripped wire sticking out, just in case I need to get a multimeter probe into there, but normally you should be able to get readings off the screw heads. It's just that by getting a multimeter probe down into those, I can be fairly confident that the signal is actually getting down the wire. Whereas inside of these, sometimes you may not have the best connection. And then, using the included little screwdriver, we just kind of firm these up a little bit. But a lot of time, you're, you're going to be able to tell the depth of the screw compared to the ones next to it that you're tight. And, you know, just kind of check a little firmness there, make sure you're all in. Um, we're going to close up the main cover. And then here we've got some connections. And then... I'm going to leave things on automatic right now, and then um, we're going to look, let's see here, what I'm going to do at this stage right now is check the website, check customer service, check the Wi-Fi, get this thing discovered on the Wi-Fi, and then go from there, um, because it's definitely got uh, a lot to mess with on this so we'll be going over this here in a little bit so here's where things are going to get tricky you want to download the app the obit beehive app download install get it all set up you're going to be at a point where you create or log in an account now when you do that this device or the account that you create uh, is an email address. So let's say we did that first name, last name, email, password, and all that kind of fun stuff. Once you marry a device to an account, it's married to that account. So even if you go to reset the device, it may, it may not do a full reset. What I discovered when I first plugged this in is I didn't go through that. I did all the hard wiring, then wanted to do the software after lunch. When it did that, it it stops tr its transmission. It stops its pairing transmission after a little while. You kind of run into this problem. Uh, what you have to do is there's a couple of stages of this. One is pairing this to a device. That device then pairs it to an account that's set up online. 
once you set it up to an account online and it's fully set up this little smartphone icon will appear this means it's been made into a smartphone um, you set up that account with an email address so if you have a client and you're putting these things together um, you, you'll probably want you know two or three email addresses let's say for a household where you're setting up the security system for example in this one we've we've set up these security cameras and so if you're doing home automation there's going to be some accounts with that I would suggest um, having some sort of a backup tablet or maybe a smartphone that, that even if it's no longer has an active phone account you you have it set up with a Wi-Fi and it could still do some email and some apps uh, have that set up as a master key to everything else and save all the passwords have those in that device and then depend on physical security for that device that way if you you pass this over to the homeowner and they have access to the passwords and everything you've got a physical device you can you can kind of get your backups out of um, so what we did was we set this up I, I set up with the accounts and we uh, we did this now what I did because this is this is one of my business phones I I transferred this over to the homeowner already so we, we're not going to show everything on this but basically because we've got four zones four sprinkler zones set up it walks you through a process on the smartphone or tablet the app in, in, interface yeah from what we could tell running it through an Apple device and an Android device the apps are identical uh, they work exactly the same way. So you define each sprinkler zone. It allows you to take a picture of each uh, sprinkler zone and give it a name. Uh, when we do that, we can manually control them or it kind of goes through its smart sense weather mode where it determines how much, um, how much water it's going to need and, and all that thing. So we're going to leave this thing on automatic. Uh, instead of manual. If you want a software controlled program and you do that from a smartphone you oh, it will override the physical controls on here so even though this turns it, it turns but it's not like those are actual notches it just kind of indicates what it's going to go on a menu screen. Um, when a smartphone has been turned off that icon goes away or if it goes out of range you know there's a couple other things that will happen um, but the thing is as long as it communicates over the internet it can communicate with this and of course control the timing it's tricky to set up but once it's set up it's pretty straightforward the other thing is you can override a lot of that by getting to the physical control if you have questions there is contact information for the company also let's see if we can get this to focus a little better also, what's going to happen is we are going to have an ongoing discussion in the comment section of this video. If you have other questions about these smart sprinkler controllers, maybe you're trying to diagnose or figure out what's going on with one. Uh, myself and a couple other people are hopefully going to be available to answer some of your questions.